Let's look together in First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians. Chapter 1, 10 verses, so I'm just going to read the whole chapter, not very long. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, under the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God, for our gospel came not to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy and the Holy Ghost, so that you were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and in Achaia, that is, Greece. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place, your faith uh, so that from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia, but in every place, your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait uh, for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us, from the wrath to come. So what we want to do today is uh, kind of follow up what we began to do last week. We want to talk about the relationship of gospel preaching, the relationship of gospel preaching to regeneration and conversion and the formation of gospel churches. What part does the preaching of the gospel play in calling God's people? effectually calling them and seeing them converted. What part does gospel preaching play in the formation of churches? So that's the topic we're on. Now the way we came to that topic from where we were in Romans 16 is this. If you go back and read the book of Romans at the last, that last chapter where all those different saints are named that we read, you remember? There were some 35 mentioned, 25 specifically by name, and then some five unnamed groups of unspecified number, we don't know how many there were, but there was at least 25 specifically named individuals. Some of them were converted Jews, some of them were converted Romans, some of them were converted Phoenicians, uh, some of them were converted Cyrenians, some of them were converted Persians, all kinds of people from all kinds of nations. And they were all Christians and they were all in the church at Rome. Some of them were married, some of them were single, some of them were male, some of them were female, some of them were former slaves, some of them were tent makers. Some of them were young, some of them were old, but they were all Christians and in the church at Rome. And Paul wrote to them affectionately and uh, greeted them in that 16th chapter. Now, the thing that that shows, one of the lessons that we learn from that is this. If you consider who wrote the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul, if you consider when he wrote it on his second missionary journey, while he was in Corinth, he wrote to the church at Rome. And if you look at that, we begin to think about there the relationship between the gospel and preaching and the effectual calling of the saints and the formation of churches. You say, well, how, how, what does that teach, how does that teach that? Well, there is no greater, more thorough explanation, at least in many people's minds, about the plan of salvation the doctrines of grace, the gospel, and the sovereignty of God that is set forth in the book of Romans. There is no greater explanation. In fact, from the beginning to end, the book of Romans is an explanation and defense of the sovereignty of God and the doctrines of grace set forth by the Apostle Paul and substantiated by Old Testament scriptures. That's what it is. It's set forth to be that. He explains the plan of salvation, how men are saved, how men are converted, 
He talks about not only our election, our predestination. He talks about our belief and our conversion and our justification. He talks about our sanctification and our holy living. He talks about our eternal security. He covers all five points, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints just in the first eight chapters. Then he talks about specifically the sovereignty of God in chapters 9, 10, and 11. Then when he gets to chapter 12, clear to the end, basically he talks about the way Christians ought to live. If you read that book of Romans. What I'm saying is, if you look at the book of Romans, it's written by the Apostle Paul, the great missionary apostle to the Gentiles. It was written while he was involved in missionary preaching to the Gentiles. He was in Corinth. Okay? And Corinth, of course, is in Achaia or lower Greece. He's preaching to Gentiles. So here you have a person who was a converted Jew who was teaching the doctors of grace, but he was preaching the gospel to Gentiles. He was out there on a missionary journey. What did we learn then? We learned that the doctrines of grace and the sovereignty of God are not opposed, they're not contrary, they're not an obstacle to preaching and to outreach and the carrying out of the Great Commission. That's what we learned. Because here's one who preached the doctrines of grace, defended the doctrines of grace, and yet what's he doing? He's out there preaching to Gentiles. He's out there on this hit where the grease hits the squeak, so to speak, on the street preaching to people about salvation. So his views of the sovereignty of God didn't prohibit his preaching. His views of the doctrines of grace didn't keep him from preaching to people. Well, brethren, so we learned this one lesson, that the doctrines of grace, that the five points of Calvinism, that Calvinism, if you will, that is properly defined, is not an obstacle to preaching the gospel. So when you hear somebody say, or somebody challenges your view of election and says, you can't believe that, if you did, then you can't believe in missions and evangelism. Well, they don't know what they're talking about. Because Paul's life, Paul's testimony, Paul's writings are a standing monument to the fact that that's false. Think about it. His very life is a standing monument to disprove the fact that the doctrines of grace are an obstacle to preaching the gospel to the lost. See? So this is what, we're, this is what we learn from the 16th chapter of the book of Romans because he's writing there to people who had come from all these different nations who had been converted by the doctrines of grace and who had been brought into the church at Rome. And yet he writes to them. And what does he write to these people of the church of Rome? Now stay with me if, if you will. What is he writing to the people of the church at Rome? Well, remember, he's on his second missionary journey. But he's writing to them about his future plans. He's on his second missionary journey, and he's writing a book to the Romans. He's never even been there before, and he's going to tell them about his future plans. And what are his future plans? Listen to this. Romans 1, verse 9. God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you in my prayer, always in my prayers, making request. If by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you, for I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and of me. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I had purpose to come unto you, but was let or was hindered hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you, even as also among other Gentiles. Paul had often proposed to go to Rome, but various things had come up so that he was not able to. But he writes and tells them that he had planned to come to them, right? Well, by the time he gets to the end of this book, in the 15th chapter, what does he say here? Let's go on and visit this. This is the 15th chapter of the book of Romans. Now, uh, there, we ought to read the whole thing, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to jump in here about... Paul speaking of himself. He said, Nevertheless, brethren, verse 15, I have written the more boldly unto you of some sort, putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God. Speaking about, in other words, his own ministry. Grace has been given to me to be a what? That I should be, in verse 16, a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. He's talking about his own ministry. Ministering the gospel of God uh, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. And I have therefore whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed, through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem 
and round about to Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Now there he's talking about what he's already done in his ministry. What he's already done about preaching. He's already preached from Jerusalem all the way up through Syria, into Cilicia, into the Taurus Mountains, into Turkey, clear across uh, Turkey, into across the Adriatic Sea, or the Aegean Sea, then into Philippi, and into Greece, and down to Corinth, and then back around again. He's made the whole circle all the way around. And not only done it once, but done it three times. See, he's talking about, I've already done all of that. So, yea, yea, verse 20, so have I strived to preach the gospel not where Christ was named, lest I build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he, was give, he is not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. That's an Old Testament prophecy of the gospel going to the Gentiles. He's quoting to prove that. And for this cause also I have been much hindered, that is, from coming to preach the gospel to you, verse 22. Now he's going to take up this subject of coming to them again. But now having no more place in these parts... And having a great desire these many years to come to you, whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way thitherward by you, if first I may be somewhat filled with your company. But now I go to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. Now, if you go on and finish this, what you're going to see is that Paul has given him basically a statement about what he's already done in his ministry what he's currently doing in his ministry, and what he plans to do in his ministry. Preaching the gospel where? In regions beyond. In other words, here in the middle of this book, or in this book, that is the apex of an explanation and defense of the doctrines of grace, you have Paul talking about preaching the gospel in places beyond Jerusalem and beyond Judea in the first chapter, and then you have him talking about it in the 15th chapter, and then you have him actually addressing Gentiles who've been converted by the gospel in the 16th chapter. In other words, this book of Romans shows us that the doctrines of grace are not contrary or are an obstacle to preaching the gospel in regions beyond. They are not contrary to carrying out the Great Commission. The question is, how do you carry out the Great Commission? With what gospel do you go to carry out the Great Commission? A lot of people, like Paul said, have a zeal for God but not according to knowledge. They believe in carrying out the Great Commission but they don't have the right message. If we don't preach what Paul preached, the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ, the gospel which he said is my gospel, and if any man preach any other, let him be accursed. If we don't go with this gospel, we don't carry out the Great Commission. And this is what we're trying to figure out here. What is the message? What is the gospel? What does it mean? And how do we preach it? What's its relationship to calling people effectually? See, this is the verse I started talking about today. We want to talk about this relationship of preaching the gospel uh, and conversion of people, people being saved and the people being converted and the building up of churches. Well, if you read this book, you'll get this idea, brethren, that the book of Romans sets the foundation for us to consider this question. It not only will testify about it, there's many things we could learn right here. But I want to pick 1 Thessalonians as our main text that we're going to be looking at. So we're going to be moving away from Romans 16, and we're going to be mainly focusing on 1 Thessalonians for a while. Now, let me just say this to you. When Paul wrote to the Romans, and this is why I want to say this, the relationship of the gospel, the relationship of the gospel and gospel preaching to people, the relationship of gospel preaching to conversion. Everybody needs, everybody, I can say this, universally needs to be saved. Everybody universally needs to be converted. And Paul says that. He says right there in the third chapter, spends the whole third chapter talking about, there is none righteous, no, not one. We can get that idea out of our head. There is nobody Righteous, no, not one. There is none, he said, that doeth good. Think about that. None. There's, in fact, Jesus said it like this. There's none good but God. There is none that understandeth. Read the third chapter of Romans. They are all together gone out of the way. So there's no doubt about it, brethren, when we say that universally everybody needs to be saved. There ain't anybody here or anywhere outside of here, anybody you know, anybody you've ever known or will know who doesn't need to be saved. The question is whether or not they know it. Whether or not they know it. 
And if anybody knows it, they only know it because God hath shined in the darkness and shined in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. God has shined in our hearts. That's the only reason any of us know it. That's why the scripture says, by grace, ye are saved. It's not because of what you do. It's not because of what you've done. And then, brethren, listen to this. Even after you're saved, even after you have been regenerated, after you have been converted, you're still going to need to be kept. You're still, you not only got to have grace to obtain salvation, as I said in my prayer, you got to have grace to sustain that salvation. That's why the scripture says he holds our soul in life. God does. We need grace all the time. I don't care if you're a preacher. I don't care if you're a song leader. I don't care if you're a deacon. I don't care what you are, man or woman, boy or girl. Everybody needs to be saved and everybody needs to be kept. And there ain't nobody ever done what they should do all the time. Solomon said it like this. He said, there is not a just man upon the earth. Now think about that a minute. He didn't say sinners. He said, there's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Christians sin. I don't have to take you very far back to, you know, to, to prove to you that Abraham was a liar. I don't have to go very far, brother, to prove that David was a liar and an adulterer and deceitful and a murderer. You can just go, I don't have to prove to you that Paul even got into an argument with Barnabas and the contention between them was so strong they had to get apart from each other. I don't have to prove to you, brethren, if you've read your Bible at all, that you know sinners sin because wickedness proceeded from the wicked and saved sinners sin. We need grace to be saved. We need grace to be kept. And so the reason I want to say all of that is to say I don't want you to be discouraged any time you're overtaken in a fault. If you fall into sin, into some temptation, that's why Jesus taught you to pray and taught me to pray this prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We not only need to be forgiven, we need to be kept out of temptation because we don't have the ability to keep ourselves. Now, what's the relationship of gospel? The gospel is an aid. Gospel preaching and the gospel and the truth of the scripture is an aid that God has given you to help you in your daily walk and in your journey as you go. When Paul wrote to these very Romans, you know what he said to them? He said this, Romans 6, 17. He said, God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. Now, if I stopped right there, it looked like he was thanking God they were sinners. But the emphasis there is on the were. The emphasis is on the past tense. God be thanked that while you were the servants of sin, you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. You were this, but now you're something else. What is he going to say? Verse, verse 18 is tied to this because it explains it. Being then made free from sin, you have become the Servants of righteousness. Now I'm going to just stop right there and say this. About people. In this world, you're either one or the other. You're either a slave to sin or you're a slave to righteousness. There is no in-between. That's the only kind of people there are. Sinners or saved sinners. But a saved sinner is somebody that's a slave to righteousness. A saved person, a regenerated person, has become a, a doulos, a slave, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if he's not that and he doesn't intend to be that, then he doesn't know what salvation's all about. He becomes a slave and a servant to Jesus Christ. He becomes a servant of righteousness. Jesus said it like this. He said, Whoever, whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. Think about that. Our cause to whomsoever you yield yourself servants indeed to obey, his servants you are, Paul said. And so, brethren, men in this world, women in this world, we're either slaves to sin or we're slaves to righteousness. We are slaves to sin and that we've never been born again. And the power of sin has never been broken. And dominion, sin has dominion over us. Or we've been regenerated and Christ has died in our place and he has taken away the guilt of sin and broken the power of sin, not destroyed the existence of sin in our life yet, but broken the power of sin in our life and enables us if we do what he tells us to do, brethren, and he blesses us with grace, 
we can live a life that is somewhat free from dominion of sin. And so that's what he's talking about here. He wrote to these Romans and he said, you were the slaves of sin, but now you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. That obe obedience, obedience there he's talking about is the obedience of faith. Read Romans chapter 1 when he says he was sent out to preach the gospel for the obedience of faith among all nations. Read the last chapter of Romans when he says the same thing. He was sent out for the obedience of faith among all nations. In other words, faith has obedience that goes with it. Faith is always coupled with love. Faith is always coupled with hope. Faith is always coupled with all the graces of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. And faith is always coupled with obedience. That's why there is the obedience of faith. The obedience that stems from faith. Well, Paul said here, these men had, and people in Rome had obeyed from the heart. This wasn't any external, insincere thing. This was from the heart. That And what did they obey? What is it they believed in so much that they obeyed it? That form of doctrine. In other words, brethren, it's our, being, our believing and obeying a certain set of doctrines, a tupas, that is a pattern of doctrine. It's by doing that that we become servants of righteousness and we break the power of sin. In other words, as we obey the truth, we believe it and we obey it. And to the extent that we do that, the more we do that, the more we're broke, that power of sin is broken in our lives, every day, in our daily walk. In other words, brethren, there is being born... And then there's growing up and making the journey of life. There's being born again, and then there's growing up and making the journey of life. It's making the journey of life not what borns you again. Well, making the journey as a Christian doesn't born you again. That just proves you are a Christian. But there are things that we ought to do. Like, for instance, as a child of God, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Men ought to read the Scriptures, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that is not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. I mean, you, there are a number of things we are told to do in the journey as a Christian. Well, brethren, right here he says to the Romans, he said, you, God be thanked that where you were the servants of sin, you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Now, you notice that statement, which was delivered you. That's a kind of a confusing statement, and it's exegetically it's the same way in the Greek. Basically what it means is that there's a form of doctrine that's been delivered to us. You can read about this in Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2.15, the traditions that have been delivered to us, that sound doctrine that Paul is always talking about in the epistles to Timothy and Titus. Give attendance to reading and to sound doctrine. And don't pay attention to anything that's, that's contrary to sound doctrine. And that sound doctrine, which is according to doctrine, there is a form of doctrine, there's a set of doctrine, there's a pattern and a group of doctrines that God the Father gave Jesus. Now listen to this. Our doctrines did, weren't invented by Paul, they weren't invented by Peter. Jesus said when they questioned his doctrine, they took a note of him that he was, spoke with authority. And he said, my doctrine is not mine, Jesus did. My doctrine is not mine, but the Father which sent me. He got his doctrine from God the Father. He said, the things which I speak, I speak not of myself. God the Father gave him the words that he was to speak, the truths that he was to speak. And then he in turn did what? He taught the apostles what they ought to preach and teach, right? They, he gave them the doctrine, and he sent them out to do what? He said, you go out and preach the gospel to all the nations, baptizing them, discipling them, and teaching them to obey whatsoever I've commanded you. In other words, the apostles received from him a set of doctrines, and then they in turn passed it on. And in the first church, what was it noted for? It was noted for the fact that they adhered to the apostles' doctrine. And the apostles don't teach a different set of doctrines. He's, it is quite common nowadays to find liberal commentators who talk about Peter's doctrine and Paul's doctrine and James's doctrine as if they were all different. But I, I hope that I'll be able to show you that they were exactly all saying the same identical thing. And we, in fact, we'll look at their teachings and see that so. Jesus said, the, for instance, Jesus said the scriptures cannot be broken. Jesus said, Father, thy word is truth. He said, not one jot or tittle shall in any wise pass from the word until all of it's fulfilled. That's what Jesus said about the scriptures. What Paul, what Peter say about it? He said, there's no scripture given. Uh, he said, there's no scripture by, given by private interpretation. Remember that? You read over in the book of 1 First, First Peter, he said there, no scriptures given by private interpretation. 
but it is given how? It's given by God. Um, to be more specific, he said, we have a more sure word of prophecy, Peter said, unto which we do well to take heed as a light that shineth in the darkness, knowing this, that no prophecy of scriptures of any private interpretation, but the prophecy came not at any time by the will of man, but what holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Jesus said it, Paul, Paul, what did Paul say about the scriptures? He said all scriptures give by inspiration of God. They all three said the same thing about the scriptures, and I intend to show you that on about 14 different points to show you that they all preach the same doctrine. Now my point is this. The Romans had believed a form of doctrine from the heart. He said, God be thanked that where you were the servants of sin, you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Now, the apostles delivered that form of doctrine to everybody they preached to. They taught them the same thing. But that's not actually what that says right there. There's more to it. They delivered to them, it's true, they delivered to them a form of doctrine. But that verse right there and the wording behind it, if you read in the NIV, the ESV, the RSV, you read in a, a plethora of other uh, translations, you will see that what that says, that word tupos actually means mold. Like we have molten metal. When you mold it, you pour it into a mold to form certain parts, mechanical parts. All right? A, a guy who works jewelry does the same thing. He forms jewelry, gold, silver, by using a mold. Once he gets it melted, he pours it in there. When it cools, it takes on the form of that mold. You take it off and you got a part, right, or a ring or whatever. Well, this doctrine that's delivered to us is like a mold for the child of God. And it is not only delivered to him, but he's delivered into it. God puts his people in that mold and they take on the shape, the characteristics of the gospel. It shapes their lives. It forms their lives. The gospel does. Think about it just a minute. If you don't believe in the sovereignty of God, then no wonder we fret and fume about our problems. If we don't believe in providence and God taking care of us, no wonder we're fearful of everything that happens. If we don't believe in prayer to a sovereign God who controls all things, including all men... If we don't believe in the sovereign God who has the hearts, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord like the rivers of water and he turns it whichever way he will, then no wonder we get upset about our political leaders. If we only trust in the arm of flesh, no wonder, brethren, when the pantry gets a little thin, we get a little shaky. But on the other hand, if you do believe what I just said in the absolute accuracy of the scripture and the sovereignty of God and his sovereignty and transcendence over everything... If you believe that God hears and answers prayer, that shapes and molds your life to be different than other people. If you believe that men ought not forsake the assembly of themselves together and you believe you ought to be in church, that's why you're here today. It molds and shapes your life. Brethren, the gospel and the things of the gospel and the word of God are not just for our objective, scientific, stand at a distance observation. They're for us to be received into the heart. You have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. So, brethren, uh, that verse of Scripture, we're going to come back to that because it talks about the relationship of the gospel to people's lives and how their lives are formed and changed by that. Now, I'm going to go and take you to a book that sets that right out there on the stage where you can see it, how some people who were pagans had their lives changed by the gospel. Okay? Now... You know the story, and I won't go all the way back through it, but you know the story of Paul's second missionary journey, how that he left Antioch and came up through uh, Galatia, went revisited some of the places he'd been on his first missionary journey, and he tried to go to the southwest, uh, but God wouldn't let him. Spirit forbade him. He tried to go to the northwest, northeast, and God wouldn't let him, and so he passed by Mizzy, and he came to Troas, and then was providentially led to cross the Aegean Sea and come to Macedonia. And one of the first places he came to was Philippi, and he had a ministry there, and people were saved. And then the Jews got a, a riot started, and basically he was run out of town and came down to Thessalonica. And that's talked about in Acts 17, verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went into them on three Sabbath days and reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is the Christ. 
One of the set of questions we got, you remember? One of the set of questions we got was, what is the true gospel? What is the true gospel? Does the gospel include proclamation of election, predestination, limited atonement? And then I think it's an interesting question. If it does include predestination and election and limited atonement, did the apostles preach the gospel in the book of Acts? Well, I'm almost amazed about that question. What kind of gospel would I think that the apostles would preach but the true gospel? But even more so, did the, God, did the apostles preach the true gospel of the book of Acts when sinners were converted? How else would they be converted? If you preach a false gospel, they're not converted by a false gospel. If they were, they'd be false converts. But anyway, if the apostles preached the true gospel of the books of Acts when sinners were converted by their preaching, well, if they did, here's a good example of it. Because the apostle Paul came here and he preached the gospel and he called it my gospel, the gospel, our gospel. He called it the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of the living God, and many other terms. But the point of it is, Paul preached the gospel when he came to Thessalonica, but here, notice how it is summarized. Notice how it's summarized. It says that Paul, as his manner was, he reasoned with him by the scriptures. It's all right. He uh, reasoned with him out of the scriptures. Reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Then it says, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered. It's important that we see that. He opened out of the scriptures. He opened with it, reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Now, I think it's important that we get that. There's a word there we need to look at. We won't take time today. But he reasoned with them out of the scriptures, and he opened and alleged or proved that Christ must needs have suffered. Christ is the Old Testament Messiah. So when Paul preached the gospel, he obviously preached about the Old Testament scriptures, and he obviously preached about Christ. Then he went on to say that this Jesus whom I preach unto you, that's the second thing he preached. He preached Christ, that he must needs have suffered, but now he also preached Jesus. That's the second point of his sermon. And then the third thing he preached was that this Jesus whom I preached unto you is the Christ. So his first point was to preach about Christ. The second point was to preach about Jesus, the Christ of prophecy, then the Jesus of history. Then his third point was to show that this Jesus of history was the Christ of prophecy. Now that tells me that the preaching of the apostles, like in so many places in the book of Acts, and I say this to you because it took me a lifetime to even learn this, and I hope you'll grasp it. I hope you'll take it home with you. When Luke wrote the book of Acts, he oftentimes summarizes things. He picks out certain things by the leadership of the Spirit that he wants to talk about. But he doesn't talk about everything. Like, for instance, when Paul preached all night long and preached to the coming up of the sun, he says that in just a few verses. He preached all night and then all the next morning until the sun came up. So he preached basically 12 hours, and he's covered in about six or seven verses. We don't know what he preached. We just know that he preached. What I'm saying to you, that's an, that's an example of the summary type statements we get about the preaching that's in the scriptures. Or when Peter exhorted them with many other words, but we don't know what words he used. So oftentimes these sermons in these scriptures are summarized, but you get main points as you go through here. And that's something that's important for us to see. Here's an example of that, but we do learn these things. He preached the Christ of the Old Testament. He didn't just preach, A, confess you're a sinner, B, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and three, confess him. That's the, you know, the famous Roman road. He didn't preach that. He preached Christ, the anointed Messiah of the Jew. To do that, you've got to go back and look at Old Testament prophecies about the Jew, who, he, who the Messiah was, what he was supposed to do, what they thought he was supposed to do. Then he had to introduce these Jews in this Thessalonican synagogue to Jesus of Judea. And tell them about his, life, about his birth, and his miraculous birth, and then his life, and then his teachings, and then his sufferings, and his death, and his burial, and his resurrection, and his ascension back to heaven. Had to inform them all about Jesus. And then he had to prove that this Jesus of history was the Christ of prophecy. He had to do quite a bit of talking is what I'm saying, more than just four verses. 
But the point of it is, you get an idea of what he preached here. Now, when you go through this, brethren, you begin to see that Paul was preaching. Now, that's what's said over there in Acts, okay? Now you come to the book of Thessalonians, and I'm just going to take time to read this to you again, okay? There are two things we want to talk about in this first chapter. I'll mention them now. We'll take them up again next week, okay? The first four verses, mainly, we want to talk about the church at Thessalonica. The church at Thessalonica. He's going to tell us some things about the nature of the church at Thessalonica. The first four verses. Paul and Silvanus, Timotheus, and of the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Now we'll just stop right there. The church in Thessalonica was recognized as a church which was rooted in and living by its union with God. Verse 1, he said, the church which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. They drew their life from God. This church did. Anytime you find a real church, it's got to be one that has vital union with God. It's got to have draw its life from God. That's a vital union. We'll have to talk about it more next week. Secondly, a real church like this church here, he says, um, remembering without ceasing your what work of faith, your labor of love, and your patience of hope. A real church like this church was noted, recognized for three outstanding graces, faith, love, and hope. They were noted for that. And any real church has got to have in it people who have faith, Love and hope, because those are the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are given in regeneration. Without those, you're not regenerated. So a church is made up of people who have living union with God. A church is made up of people who have been regenerated and have a faith that works. And a love that labors. And a hope that endures in spite of opposition and obstacles. They had to worry about getting arrested. We only have to worry about sirens. Think about it. In other words, the hope that a child of God has endures because it looks to the future. It endures in spite of difficulties and afflictions, which is the great message of the book of Hebrews. But my point is, what is a church? It's recognized as a community, assembly of people who have faith that, that works and, and love that labors for others and God and hope that endures. But then notice one more thing. He said, brethren, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. A true church is made up of people who are eternally loved of God, beloved of God, and are made up of people who have been elected by God. That's what a church is. Without those characteristics right there, vital union, living union with God, regeneration manifested in, in faith, love, and hope, and being eternally beloved of God. If you put them all together, a church is a congregation of people who have, who have been elect, beloved and elected of God before the world began, who have live, living vital union with him, and because of that, they manifested in faith and love and hope. That's what a congregation is. It's not bricks, it's not mortar, it's not buildings, it's not bus ministries. It's people who have those characteristics. That's what a church of Jesus Christ is, and we'll talk more about it next week. Now, let's notice next the gospel of God. Not the church of God, but the gospel of God that came to Thessalonica and gathered these people together and they were converted and became a church. Okay? And it's in 5, 5 to 10. He said, our gospel came not to you in word only, but it came, he said, in also in power. And it came in the Holy Ghost. And it came in much assurance or much conviction. And it came openly and publicly and, and transparently because you know what manner of men we were among you. And as a result of that gospel coming that way, something happened to you. He said, you became followers of us and of the Lord. Became disciples. And you did that. You received the word in much affliction. We're not the only ones that have trouble. We're not the only ones that have trials and opposition. These people from the start had opposition when they very began the church. Go back and read Acts 17 and tell me what happened there in Thessalonica when the gospel came to them. And tell me what happened to Paul everywhere he went. 
Affliction and opposition and trials are part of the Christian life. So, brethren, we got to get used to that. We've got to figure out what's going on, why it happens, and how we should respond. But then notice what he goes on to say. The gospel came to them, but the gospel then was sounded out from them. Verse 8. From you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also, what all he said, but also in every place your faith to God were is spoken of. In other words, brother, one of the things that marked this church about the, it's God, about the gospel coming to it was that they not only embraced the gospel, but they spread the gospel. And they spread it actively, and they spread it passively. That is, they did it verbally. They spoke it out, but then other people spoke about them. Notice that. He said, from you, verse 8, sounded out the word of the Lord. Not only in Macedonia, Achaia, but then he went on to say this but also in every place. Your faith to Godward is spread abroad. Other people began to talk about what happened in Macedonia, in Thessalonica. So they actively echoed it out, and then others began to talk about how they changed and what happened to them. So they, passed, they actively and passively spread the gospel. So what do we learn here? And what, by the way, what did these other people say about the Thessalonians? When they began to talk about the Thessalonians and how they received the gospel, what did they say about the Thessalonians? Verse 9. These other people show us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how you turn to God, how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead. They talked about how they turned from idols and they turned to the living God. And they turned to serve the living God and to wait for his son from heaven. That's what other people talked about them. They recognized these things in the Thessalonians. Now, brethren, what does that tell me? That tells me that the same thing happened in Thessalonica, in Thessalonica that happened in Rome. God be thanked that whereas you were the servants of sin, these guys were servants of idols. You obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine and became the servants of righteousness. You turned from idols to serve the living and true God. It's the same identical thing. May the Lord give us grace to look into his word, brethren, to understand what the gospel is and how God uses the gospel to call his elect to himself, to convert them and to build them up in their faith and to gather churches. And then, of course, Paul goes on in this, this epistle to show us many things about a gospel church. How, God, how does God develop a church by preaching the gospel? How, how, how brethren, is the church taught and formed? And what are their weaknesses and what are their strengths? And what does the gospel have to do with all that? The book of First Thessalonians, as little as it is, is packed with that. By the way, let me just say this. There's only one book in the New Testament earlier in Paul's writings earlier than this, and that's Galatians. It was written prior to the 15th chapter of Acts. And if our chronology is right, 1 Thessalonians is the very next book that was preached. You want to know when it was written? 49 to 50 A.D. Now, if that's correct, then this epistle to the church at Thessalonica, think about it, 49 to 50. And if Christ, our chronology was correct, was crucified when, at year 33 to 34, you're only talking 16 years down the road since Christ died. So you're getting a look here inside a first century a mid-first century church and what God did and what God does with the gospel. If you ever want to know what a gospel church is, here's an opportunity to find out what it is. If you ever want to know what the real gospel is, what you ought to be listening to and supporting, if we study this and God bless it, we'll have some idea about that, brethren, and know the utility of God. May God bless it, but remember this. The gospel, basically, when it's all said and done, boils down to the fact that men are sinners and the Lord Jesus Christ receiveth sinful men. Personally, as long as the Gadarean story is in Mark 5, Bill Lee has hope. As long as the story of the lepers and the blind men, Bartimaeus, etc., are in there, Bill Lee has hope. As long as David's story is in there in Psalm 51, Bill Lee has hope. Let us not look to ourselves. Let our confidence be like Paul said. My confidence is to Godward. May God give us confidence in him and not in ourselves. Let's pray.